Welcome to The Cognitive Crucible, produced by the Information Professionals Association. Our website is information-professionals.org, where you can find links and information about today's conversation and get access to members-only content. Join John Bicknell and explore all aspects of our generational challenge, cognitive security. The Cognitive Crucible is a forum that presents different perspectives and emerging thought leadership related to the information environment. The opinions expressed by guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of or endorsement by the Information Professionals Association. My guest today on The Cognitive Crucible is Major Cassandra Brooker, who is an Australian intelligence officer, and she is currently posted to the Advanced Warfighting Evaluation Section, developing future and emerging threat products in support of the Australian Army's aviation capability. Cass Brooker, welcome to The Cognitive Crucible. Hi, John. Thanks for having me. Before we get started, I'd like to remind our audience that Cass Brooker's opinions are her own and do not reflect the opinions of the Australian Defence Force or Australia. And also to our audience, uh, today we're going to be getting a readout from Cass on a master's paper that she wrote and recently published. And I've been wanting to do this kind of thing for some time now. So uh, for those listening who are in a master's program or in a PhD program, um, even bachelor's students, if you're doing something interesting that is related to cognitive security, operations in the information environment, I would love to invite you onto the program to give our audience a readout of your research. And so with that, Cass, uh, the conversation that I want to have with you today centers around your recent paper, and the t it is entitled The Effectiveness of Influence Activities in Information Warfare, and we will have a link to this in the show notes. But before we get into this paper, cast, could you give our audience a little bit more background about your career? Yep, sure. So I grew up in New Zealand and spent two years in the Royal New Zealand Air Force, before leaving to go backpacking around the world, as you do. Um, as a dual citizen, I then moved to Australia and graduated from the Royal Military College into the Royal Australian Corps of Transport in 2002. Um, I experienced regimental time as a logistics operations officer at the 5th Aviation Regiment and then as a platoon commander. Uh, following my core transfer in 2005 to the Australian Intelligence Corps, I haven't really followed the usual career path of a general service officer. Rather, I've experienced a range of specialised intelligence postings, predominantly focused on aviation, geospatial intelligence, remote sensing and strategic ISR capabilities. I was the first Army officer to be posted into one ground liaison group in support of the RAF Air Operations Centre. And as a Vietnamese linguist, I was the first ADF bilateral exchange officer to attend the Military Science Academy in Hanoi. I was also the first, and as far as I know, the only intelligence officer to complete a graduate diploma in geographic information science at the University of Queensland which uh, just used to be reserved for topographical engineers. In 2019, I was awarded a Chief of Army Scholarship to research the effectiveness of influence activities and in information warfare. Accordingly, I attained a Master's of Research through the University of New South Wales last year. I also hold a Master's of Justice, majoring in intelligence from the Queensland University of Technology. I have deployed three times uh, to Baghdad in 2007 as an intelligence watchkeeper on Op Catalyst, to Afghanistan in 2012 in support of the Special Operations Task Group on Op Slipper, and back to Iraq again in 2016 as the J5 intelligence planner in the US-led uh, SIGIFLIC or the Land Component Command on Operation Okra. So that's it in a nutshell, John. Perhaps we can step into your paper just a little bit. So in your paper, uh, again, link in the show notes, you assert that Western democracies are already at war in the information domain and are being outcommunicated by adversaries. Could you unpack this a little bit more? Yes. So 
as we know, due to globalised power shifts, technological advances and increasingly interconnected, ungoverned communications networks, the lines are now blurred between political, civil and military information environments. Information age threats now bypass our physical borders, they poison public debate, sow distrust of institutions and attack government, industry, media and society. It's, it's unstoppable, deniable, completely legal and has blurred the lines between politics and war. There are more than 3.8 billion people online, 2.9 billion on social media. So Western nations must view this complexity as an opportunity to exploit to our advantage. As we've seen with Brexit, the US election in 2016, the rise of QAnon, Western democracies are being manipulated and outcommunicated every day by belligerent actors who are either controlling the narrative or simply undermining the truth. While Russia's active measures are not new, it, along with tech-savvy groups such as ISIS, have managed to exploit the opportunities presented by this new world order and hybrid battle space. Adversary information warfare tactics are difficult to counter or even track effectively due to their unconventional methods, uh, rapid widespread dissemination and highly networked, less hierarchical and less institutional I-war system structures. The Joint Information Warfare Directorate in Canberra actually states that not since World War II has Australia been directly threatened in this way. Hmm. So while Western democracies are strong on cyber, uh, technology and kinetic approaches in conventional warfare, the rise of influence activities is the new sharp power in information warfare. As Lawrence Friedman said, superiority in the physical environment is of little value unless it can be translated into an advantage in the information environment. The West has been somewhat complacent, reactive and risk averse in dealing with this new frontier of hybrid political warfare. Our adversaries know that to compete on the traditional playing field of conventional warfare is disadvantageous and therefore they've asymmetrically dislocated Western nations' dominant military and political power through their use of cognitive warfare tactics. Information warfare is today no longer an enabling function supporting military operations in physical domains. The information environment is a multidisciplinary cognitive function in its own right and a whole new geopolitical realm and a military domain. So that's why I applied for the scholarship, as I identified this vulnerability as a key gap that I hoped to solve through my research, and, you know, that is regaining the initiative and positively influencing global audiences whilst overcoming the limitations of our democratic values. Right, right. Thanks for that. Well, I, I think you are uh, right smack dab in the middle of uh, some of the most interesting and pressing uh, research that is uh, going on right now, for sure. So uh, you 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 picked a you picked a good area to uh, focus your efforts. Um, I'd like to ask you a little bit more about uh, the disciplines that you're bringing into this paper, and but before. I ask you to describe these. I'd like to suggest to the audience, um, she, uh, Cass has a nifty Venn diagram in her paper. It's uh, figure three, uh, which describes three different uh, research disciplines that she brings and kind of melds together and I want to ask her to describe that but uh, as she's doing that the audience might benefit from uh, actually going to the paper and uh, following along on this Venn diagram as she uh, describes uh, so, uh, some of this methodology so do you, do you think you could take a, a moment or two Cass and and talk about these uh, disciplines that you are uh, bringing into this uh, uh, research agenda? Yes, certainly. So my research takes a systems thinking approach to holistically understand and target uh, complex social adaptive systems of our adversaries and provides methods for developing effective influence and counter-influence strategies for our own force systems. 
the fusion of the three research disciplines of systems thinking, influencing, and behavioral science has never been done before. And this enables a deeper understanding of enemy systems, their eye war tactics, and their aims of achieving maximum psychological effect through the exploitation of heuristics and cognitive biases. So as you will see in that Venn diagram that you've referenced, um, it depicts how these three disciplines overlap and complement each other. So regarding systems thinking, firstly, first of all, um, my systems thinking research and methodology proved superior to current doctrinal approaches for analyzing and understanding I war problems. Linear or reductionist analytical approaches are not suited to complex environments nor unstructured problems. Um, some people call these wicked problems and they tend to oversimplify the system. That said, I still employed traditional analytical techniques to complement my methodology, such as center of gravity constructs, network and link analyses. My methodology provided a holistic understanding of complex social systems of ourselves, our adversaries and target audiences, specifically the hidden part of the iceberg model of systems leverage, that is those unseen mental models, behaviors, structures and archetypes uh, affecting system resilience and function. Systems thinking also enables us to better understand our own fragility and vulnerabilities across all aspects of democratic society, which facilitates our increased resilience, cognition, and effectiveness in information warfare. My systems research found four key elements to better understanding system effectiveness. And this doesn't just apply to systems um, from an influencing perspective. So those four elements are firstly system characteristics. So whether a system is resilient or fragile and whether it is open or closed. So a robust or resilient system characterizes those that are able to tolerate stress and recover from shock. Therefore targeting those is a wasted effort. Um, a fragile system deteriorates when it's stressed while an anti-fragile system grows stronger. Secondly, is the system flows. So specifically those feedback loops and cycles that are enabled by hard and soft communications links, resources, and ideology. The third one was control within the system. And uh, the final one, a centrality of focus. Understanding these elements and systems more generally also enables the streamlining of intelligence collection operations to determine impacts on adversary system functionality and target audiences. Holistic understanding of the hidden elements and the flows within a complex social system was enhanced by my research into behavioral science and influencing theories. So moving on to influence effectiveness, my research into influence exposed 10 key features of successful propaganda, marketing, advertising, and I-war tactics, which are outlined in my paper is yeah, influence effectiveness. Um, and so I fused those 10 key features that I um, distilled down uh, with the behavioral science, um, the third discipline, and came up with five important requirements for influencing success. And uh, these five requirements also correlated with Singer and Brookings theory in their book, Like War. So those five elements, as a reminder to everyone, uh, for influencing success are narrative, emotion, authenticity, community, and inundation. And as demonstrated by ISIS as an influencing system, those were all underlying keystones for their success. In addition, successful influence was not only linked to the behavioral science and exploitation of heuristics, but also relied on the power that hard and soft communications links hold in creating and strengthening the interconnections within components of complex social systems. Conversely, Western nations face a number of difficulties to effective influencing in the I war and find themselves at a distinct disadvantage. That is, the West largely seeks to be logical, consistent, transparent, and accountable. However, these are not the values of a good troll, uh, nor an effective influencer. 
So the third discipline, the behavioural science research, was extremely valuable in that I uncovered nudge and behavioural economics theories, psychological shortcuts, heuristics and biases that contribute to both the success of influencing activities as well as providing understanding of social system interconnections and how to best manipulate or leverage system behaviors and responses. A number of human behavioral traits are exploited by propagandists, marketers, advertisers, and campaigners to nudge or persuade audiences more effectively. Many of these techniques, which capitalize on heuristics and bias, seek to ensure target audiences only superficially analyze information with their system one thought process. That is, they take mental shortcuts and make quick automatic decisions based on emotion and unconscious processes of perception and memory. By unpacking system one versus system two cognitive behaviors and heuristics, I found they interlinked with the 10 influence effectiveness categories and are successfully exploited by our adversaries in information warfare. For example, using social or emotional contagions on social media to evoke an in-group or us versus them sense of community and to arouse emotions. The stronger the emotions involved, the more likely content will go viral with anger spreading faster, further and being more influential than any other emotion. My behavioral science research also highlighted the importance of employing different cultural lenses and unbiased paradigms in influencing target audiences, uh, as well as promoting education, inoculation, and critical thinking in countering eye war tactics. Understanding behavioral economics is important for effective analysis of complex adaptive social systems, as human behavior is often unpredictable and inexplicable and therefore is also important for effective influencing or targeting. Yeah, thanks, Cass. That's a, a fantastic, uh, a, I guess, a crash course in those disciplines, but also uh, describes nicely how you're uh, bringing them together. I, do you mind if I ask you a follow-up on that? Are, are you aware of any other uh, researchers who have attempted to bring these disciplines uh, together, like like you're describing. Um, no, I'm not aware of any other dis uh, researchers who have combined all three disciplines. I know that some research uh, covers applying behavioral economics or behavioral science to uh, influencing, specifically in mm -hmm. advertising. Um, and propaganda, but I don't know any other researchers that have also included uh, a systems thinking analysis in this way. Mm, right. Well, um, uh, you, uh, you know, m making this 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 novel contribution, I'm sure, is going to uh, provide a lot of uh, uh, thought provoking uh, discussion uh, amongst members of our audience and and others who are. Uh, encountering your work through other means. Uh, big, big foot stomp. Uh, we, we've had a number of discussions on the cognitive crucible about uh, uh, systems, complex systems, and how uh, looking at things from a complex systems vantage is uh, no longer nice to have but it's it's becoming more you know mandatory and uh, we can expect to encounter more problems which require a systems approach in order to either mitigate the risk or you know to get ahead of uh, and and stay ahead of uh, the kinds of problems that that we're likely to encounter along these same lines you you mentioned this and I just wanted to ask you a little bit more about it so you you discuss in your paper quite a bit the notion of uh, feedback loops. Uh, and I, I think that that's critical to understand your approach. Uh, do you think you could talk a little bit about what you mean by feedback loops and why they're important? Yes, certainly. So my systems thinking methodology was employed to compare two contrasting case studies to determine their respective influencing effectiveness. So the successful case system comprising the terrorist group ISIS was compared and contrasted with the unsuccessful case system of Hillary Clinton's 2016 election campaign. 
using a single stock of influence to determine relevant reinforcing and balancing feedback loops. So think of the stock, in this case influence, as the water level in a bathtub. The taps filling up the bath are positive feedback loops and the drain pipe out the plug hole is a negative feedback loop. So feedback loops change the stock levels by affecting a flow into or out of that same stock. Uh, a negative feedback loop is also known as a balancing feedback loop because it opposes or reverses whatever direction of change is imposed on the system. Whilst a positive feedback loop is also called a reinforcing feedback loop. And this is an amplifying or enhancing loop reinforcing the direction of change. And these loops can either be vicious or virtuous cycles. Um, in ISIS case, it was a virtuous cycle. That is topping up the stock of influence faster than the balancing feedback loops could empty it. Conversely, Clinton's campaign was the opposite with a vicious reinforcing feedback loop outpacing her balancing feedback loops and therefore sinking her influence stocks. So ISIS uh, virtuous reinforcing feedback loop comprised four smaller reinforcing loops and it's that its subsystems contributed to, which were, the first one was a sense of community. So their influence stocks were reinforced through the increased participation and support of members who identified with in-group narratives social contagions, unified tribal dynamics, and heuristic biases that were manipulated by ISIS. The second loop was a success to the successful archetype. Influence grew with power and authority, resulting from winning actions, when, which in turn provided more reinforcing feedback and momentum for the adaptive anticipatory escalation of continued success in a virtuous cycle. The third loop was a sense of purpose. So ISIS used ideology and narrative um, and influence over their target audiences grew, motivation of members was reinforced and ideological narrative spread, um, particularly when there is a justified belief in the cause, the purpose is perceived as authentic and legitimate and pride is derived from participation. And the fourth loop was the exposure loop. So that is the effective exploitation of IO tactics, communications links and behavioral economics as an information jihad. Um, so this was designed to virally inundate and control audience perceptions to build legitimacy, reinforce the narrative and dominate the information environment. Hmm. So if reinforcing feedback loops are allowed to exponentially escalate with no effective balancing feedback, this would result in an eventual collapse of the system, regardless of whether it's a virtuous or vicious cycle. So while ISIS system initially comprised a virtuous cycle of strong reinforcing loops, creating rapid growth and influence, eventually the balancing feedback caught up. So due to a combination of internal and external factors, we saw three key balancing feedback loops, and they were a counter-influence loop, uh, a loss of control loop, and a drift to low performance balancing feedback loop. This is not to say that ISIS did not adapt to this balancing feedback. Uh, they were still a highly resilient system, and despite physical losses, effectively maintained its influence among its sources and virtual tribe. In contrast to ISIS, the Clinton campaign suffered a vicious reinforcing cycle resulting from feedback associated with internal and external system events and activities. This impacted on the influence stock in a downward spiral. The three reinforcing feedback loops contributing to this overall downwards trend, which incidentally you'll note reflect ISIS's balancing feedback loops, mm. include uh, a counter influence loop where influence was diminished through the conduct of effective, diverse, multi axes uh, counter influence activities designed to undermine the Clinton system's resilience and ideology. Uh, so, influence stocks were sunk um, by ta target audiences being manipulated and subsequently identifying with in group narratives, social and emotional contagions, unifying nationalist dynamics and heuristic biases exploited by external elements. 
Influence stocks were further weakened by the effective manipulation of communications links and information platforms. The second loop was a loss of authority and control loop. So here influence diminished concurrently with the reduced authority and a loss of control within the system resulting from misguided reactions to those counter influence feedback loop and the targeting of Clinton's credibility. The loss of control and authority resulted in reputational damage, undermined Clinton's legitimacy and reinforced false perceptions, which eroded the balancing feedback that she had relating to credibility and a sense of community. And the third one was a drift to low performance loop. So this loop resulted from vicious reinforcing feedback, including lost support, ineffective communications, competing systems goals, subsystem policy resistance, accidental adversaries, and a decline in resilience. This loop impacted the sense of purpose balancing feedback loop due to lowered morale, undermining of the ideology, and increased disillusionment and division. So the balancing feedback loops that should have kept Clinton's system state in an acceptable level were overwhelmed by the downward spiral created by these reinforcing loops. However, the campaign source influence stock and balancing feedback loops ensured the system survived and continued to maintain a base level stock until the election. That is, the system didn't actually collapse within the time period. So Clinton's balancing feedback loops were a sense of purpose loop um, from her policy um, announcements and uh, incorporation of various diverse um, voting public, mm -hmm. a credibility loop. Um, a lot of that was from Bill Clinton's legacy and also her time as Secretary of State and a sense of community feedback loop where she did really come across as inclusive. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that's all the feedback loops in a nutshell there, John. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I should uh, tell our audience uh, that in, in the paper, uh, Cass has some phenomenal visualizations of these feedback loops, which are the kinds of diagrams that I can look at for a long time and, you know, continue to get insights. Uh, just uh, heartily recommend that, you know, people who are, who are uh, interested to to actually go and, and check these out and uh, spend some time with it. Um, uh, well, well done on all this cast, by the way. It's not, uh, not easy to put together uh, these types of insightful diagrams. Um, you've touched on this already a little bit, Cass. So you, you've got these two different case studies, right? One for ISIS and one for the 2016 uh, Hillary Clinton presidential campaign. Do you think you could just tell our audience uh, you know, what your key findings were uh, relative to each of these case studies? Yes, certainly. So I selected these two systems because they're similar in size. They could both be analyzed with respect to a single stock of influence, and the analysis could be bounded by a specific time period. Their center of gravities and therefore their critical capabilities and critical vulnerabilities were similar, yet their system characteristics contrasted with each other, meaning that a comparative analysis of why and how that contributed to their respective levels of influence effectiveness was highly useful. So ISIS was a high resilience anticipatory system and also a relatively closed system, although not as closed as say an authoritarian regime. Whereas the Clinton campaign was an open system with some fragility sitting initially at robust. So this was my start state for the research methodology. And obviously as time went on and the balancing and reinforcing feedback kicked in, their system suffered changes in resilience. So four key themes became apparent as contributing to ISIS effectiveness. Their system characteristics of being a relatively closed system with a high level of resilience uh, was the first one. They had 
very efficient system flows, both via feedback loops and through the strength of their hard and soft communication and interconnections between subsystems. They had and maintained control, which was a critical capability and a vital reinforcing element to increasing their influence stocks. And fourthly, they had a centrality of focus, which we see among quite a few of our adversaries in the eye war. So there, this is where their influence activities were their main priority and purpose driving all their system outputs and which contributed to strengthening all four reinforcing feedback loops. So Western nations can definitely learn from this example. Conversely, the four key themes contributing to Clinton's campaign system is ineffectiveness. Uh, were the system characteristics of Clinton's campaign being an open system with lower levels of resilience and therefore a higher propensity towards increasing fragility and a lack of responsiveness. Um, the inefficiency of the system flows via both feedback loops and hard and soft interconnections. So this led to delays in feedback, misguided responses, a lack of situational awareness and an asymmetric increase of reinforcing feedback. Uh, thirdly, increasingly losing control, so specifically of the narrative, the campaign's credibility and Clinton's image. So control was both a critical capability and a vital balancing element. And lastly, again, lacking that centrality of focus. So where, unlike ISIS, Clinton's campaign influence activities were not the main priority driving all system outputs, the stovepiped, slow traditional campaign media strategies contrasted sharply with the agile, adaptive eye war tactics of Clinton's adversaries. So this lack of focus on the system's stock and purpose contributed to the asymmetric escalation of all three feedback loops, uh, reinforcing feedback loops. The research also reinforced the importance of conducting and own force holistic systems analysis before even attempting to try and target an adversary or neutral audience. And other important findings included uh, having a freedom of creative action in the eye war. Uh, this is vitally important for developing anticipatory levels of resilience and basically not having our adversaries run rings around us. Uh, critical thinking must replace linear doctrinal thought processes and eye war practitioners should apply the key findings from all three research disciplines as I've described. While there's no one solution to countering the modern eye war threat, my research has shown that a proactive, anticipatory, cooperative, non-conventional approach, which leverages adversary system weaknesses and biases, whilst building our own system resilience and stocks is the most effective method. A couple of follow-up questions is if the I may. Threat. So with the, uh, you, you mentioned at the top your military, your your deployed military experience, plus your your uh, experience as an intelligence uh, analyst as well. What did you learn during the course of this uh, research about ISIS that you did not already know? You probably came to this project with some 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 prior assumptions. How did you update your own personal beliefs about uh, ISIS and maybe even uh, extrapolate that out a little bit to you know, terrorist networks in general, if you're able to do so? Yes. So um, when I deployed to Iraq in 2016-17 with the Sajiflik, I was the uh, joint, in, joint intelligence planner. So I was contributing to the plan shop um, campaign plan to defeat ISIS in Iraq. Um, and so my focus was very much, you know, an intelligence focus, um, predicting what they were going to do next, um, you know, doing terrain analysis, uh, white force analysis, all that sort of stuff. So, and all my sources were obviously classified um, yeah. and, you know, general background studies and things like that. So while I was there, we would conduct massive war games with all the staffs and included in that was the uh, influence activities staff or the IO staff. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we could see early on that ISIS were very tech savvy, very media savvy, um, and they built upon lessons learned from Al Qaeda and you know other 
terrorist groups, um, but they were less hierarchical and, um, you know, you could destroy one part of the network and it would just, you know, like an optical ball, scroll back the leg and they had that redundancy as well. So um, I didn't really realise it at the time, but once I got into this research, you sort of, um, you, and you're looking at more open source narrative data, you're looking at, you know, uh, qualitative information coming from social media and non-traditional sources and you really um, that really helped me do the systems analysis and I sort of regret now that I didn't know about systems thinking analysis when I was deployed because it would have just um, provided us a lot more options and courses of action um, in the information environment. Yeah, that was the other question that I had for you. Is like, what, you know, what, what do you wish you knew then that you know now? And I guess uh, the answer is a systems thinking mindset, perhaps. Yes, and after I came back, I attended the um, information environment analytical course uh, that was run by an American company. Um, and that was where I was first exposed to system thinking analysis and sort of um, breaking down uh, organizations into a system and identifying those nodes and interconnections and flows, which is, uh, as an intelligence officer, highly valuable, um, but I recommend it to all planners. Mm -hmm. So you, you must have you know, very meticulously uh, mapped these out in your mind and maybe on on whiteboards and probably went through a bunch of iterations to 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 get these diagrams right what what was your process for doing that yeah pretty much as you said i believe there are um algorithms or programs that can do similar to network analysis that can do um do it electronically for you but i'm a bit analog in my approach um and i think if you're writing things down you think more critically than when you're using a computer. So yes, there were lots of diagrams, um, pictures, uh, linkages, lines all over the place. But I also, I didn't discard um, analytical techniques that I already uh, knew in, or had in my toolbox. So I used a center of gravity analysis to start with and identified critical capabilities and critical vulnerabilities to really nail down the key components of the systems. What do you think the uh, next step is with with this kind of research? You know, if two, three, five years from now, you know, somebody who's who, who's read your read your report and they want to take it to the next level, you know, where where do you see this going? Um, I hope it's it's still a bit of a niche capability at the moment, particularly in defence. But I hope in the future that um, it's just another tool that's incorporated into strategic and operational planning because um, you can't really target another uh, adversary system until you know yourself so really um, western nations need to conduct an own system analysis and really understand themselves and their own uh, critical capabilities and vulnerabilities and those interconnections and where weaknesses may lie as well as um, the hidden part of the iceberg, as I mentioned, so mental models and archetypes that may be playing in the background that we're not aware of. And then from there, once you understand yourself, you are better able to influence or target uh, either neutral audiences or adversary systems. Mm, yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah, uh, red teaming. Uh, yes. projects, uh, but then you know, there's commercial applications for this as well. Uh, uh, commercial firms are competing with one another in their own versions of uh, operations below the level of armed conflict. So uh, these this type of um, systems mapping of the competitive environment of, um, of uh, organizations would be valuable as yes. well. And it's, it's holistic. So, you know, things don't link up nicely. It's, it's like a big mind map. Uh, whereas if you're doing an IPB and you're just ticking the boxes, um, analyzing the enemy and, you know, the, 
their terrain and their locations and their capabilities and just ticking those boxes, you're not really thinking critically and making those connections. Hmm, right, for sure. Uh, what kind of reaction has your paper gotten from uh, the military community and others who have uh, approached you on it? So while I have experienced some academic snobbery for completing a master's of research thesis rather than a PhD, um, and I also found my paper and seminar were censored due to my observations around the US election and espousing some uncomfortable truths for Western democracies, uh, for the most part, the feedback has been positive. Um, and, you know, because I am the first person to combine all three research disciplines, I have been invited to deliver a few seminars and IWAR practitioners are now using my methodology, which was the key driver to my writing this uh, a, a occasional paper. So it's an, ex an accessible abridged version of my thesis. Um, many pundits believed that ISIS was defeated through kinetic targeting on the physical battle space, whereas in truth, their virtual caliphate remains undefeated in the information domain. I did have one student criticise me that I was being supportive of ISIS, but I believe that we should not be so arrogant as to discard the important lessons that their influencing success, freedom of creative action, centrality of focus and eye war tactics can teach us. Um, my original thesis received a first class pass with one of my examiners commenting that, quote, overall, this is outstanding research, timely and important within the contemporary context, both nationally and internationally. This is the kind of thesis that I expect to receive many downloads and as it will be of interest to scholars and practitioners worldwide. Its potential for impact is considerable. So that was certainly my hope when I applied for the scholarship that my research could be applied practically to improve Western nations resilience in the eye war. All right, very good. Well, uh, before I let you go, Cass, uh, do you think you could recommend a, a book or, or any other online resource that uh, might be related to the discussion we've been having or in anything else related uh, to operations in the information environment that you think our audience might appreciate? Uh, yep, sure. So I have referenced a number of information warfare books and authors in both my thesis and my paper um, that your other guests previously have already recommended. And I've also referenced a few of those guests. Um, therefore, today I'll recommend the book Systems Thinking for Social Change by David Peter Stroh. So this is an excellent resource for practitioners on how to conduct systems thinking analysis for understanding complex social systems, conflict analysis, strategic planning, and for affecting long lasting social change. So Stroh demonstrates various social systems, uh, sorry, deconstructs various social systems into their key elements and feedback loops in order to demonstrate the unintended consequences of the uninformed policies or quick fix decisions that create causal negative feedback cycles in systems that you are trying to fix. So, and it, again, another really good practitioner guide. Um, also, if I may, uh, I'd like to recommend another very informative paper. It's called Systems Confrontation and System Destruction Warfare. How the Chinese People's Liberation Army Seeks to Wage Modern Warfare by Jeffrey Engstrom of the Rand Corporation. So Engstrom explains how the PLA now characterizes and understands modern warfare as a confrontation between opposing operational systems rather than merely opposing armies. Um, and the Chinese have done extensive systems analysis of both their own and adversary systems. The PLA's theory of victory in modern warfare recognizes system destruction as the current method of modern warfighting. So under this theory, warfare is no longer centered on the annihilation of enemy forces on the battlefield. Rather, it is won by the belligerent that can disrupt, paralyze, or destroy the operational capability of the enemy system through kinetic and non-kinetic strikes against key points and nodes, while simultaneously employing a more robust, capable and adaptable operational system of its own. 
And in my opinion, that's exactly what Western nations should be doing as well. All right. Some solid recommendations there for sure. And with that, Major Cass Brooker, thank you so much for being on The Cognitive Crucible. Thank you, John. It's been a pleasure. The Cognitive Crucible is the only podcast dedicated to increasing interdisciplinary collaboration between information operations practitioners, scholars, and policymakers. To find out more about the Information Professionals Association, visit us at information-professionals.org. Please support our podcast by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review.